Abdul Aziz Saeed. I've come to appreciate him for his high spiritual integrity and his wisdom, which he carries in his being and he demonstrates in his doing. As he calls his cover, he is a professor of international relations at the American University in Washington, D.C. He's a distinguished authority on world politics, an expert in the Middle East, and a mentor to Petra Kelly. He coordinates citizens' diplomacy projects with the Palestinians and the, the Israelis, helping them to find a vision of cooperation and peace. He's written extensive articles and books on human relations, international relations, uh, multinational corporations, and terrorism. He lectures in the United States and throughout the world. Presently, at the American University, he's received grants to develop peace studies and now has three projects on the go. One of them is conducting an institute for elementary and high school teachers to train them to teach peace to their students. As well, he has something called the Washington Peace Seminar, which is to teach peace studies to university students from around the world through field work and lecture and hands-on type work. As well, he's setting up a concentration on peace studies in that university that is multidimensional, which moves into the social, the natural, the physical sciences, and as well, the humanities. He's a man who moves things. I find him a beautiful man, and a very beautiful person. Abdul. Returning to Syria and meeting with the person who has been responsible for my own spiritual life, what we do when we meet, the first thing we do is we pray together. And while praying together, he always asks me to pray out loud while praying. And I prayed out loud, doing what I did earlier, invoking names of prophets. And while invoking names of prophets, he heard me mention the name of Ralph. Now he said, he, when I finished, he said, now I have heard of Abraham and Martin Luther King and Pat Michie. <coughs> and Barbara Max Hubbard, but I've never heard of Ralph. Tell me about Ralph. <laughs> <laughs> so I told him about Ralph. Ralph uh, is one of the many prophets. Ralph lives in El Paso, Texas. In El Paso, there is a military academy, Sergeant Major's Academy, and they had invited me to speak at the academy, and they said that when you arrive, someone from the academy will meet you at the airport. And this was between Thanksgiving and Christmas, so about the 10th of December, uh, 10th or 8th. Arriving at the airport, El Paso Airport is a small airport. It was very crowded. And there a man comes wearing his fatigues, military officer, and looking at one another, I saluted him, said, I'm Ralph, and said, I'm Abdulaziz, said, I'm your escort officer. And a couple of steps later, Ralph disappears. I looked for Ralph, there was no Ralph. So I kept looking, then finally I saw Ralph assisting an elderly lady whose luggage had opened, and he was putting the luggage back together, the crowds were moving. Then silently, as he was doing his job, he came, we walked together. A few steps later, Ralph disappears again. <laughs> kept looking at Ralph was, he had two children in his hands, and they were up, there was a Santa Claus, and they had put them up for their parents to take pictures with Santa Claus. 
they have their mother with them. He came back, then we left again, and again, a few seconds later, that disappears again. <laughs> and this time, I saw him was fiddling in his hand, putting whatever money he had in boxes that they were making collections. Silently, he came back. Silently, we walked together. We arrived at the guest house. He said, would you like dinner? I said, yes. I said, Ralph, where did you learn to do what you do? We looked at one another. We understood one another. He said, in Vietnam. He said, 20 years ago in Vietnam. He said, then I was a younger man. I was about 21. I was an officer, young officer. My mission was to clear the mines for the others coming after me. My group, our job was to clean mines. He said, we went there. Everyone, every time one of us takes a step, he's finished. He said, I look to my left and my friend Bob is gone. Then another step and Jim is gone. And then another step and Greg is gone. He said, all around me, everyone was disappearing. He said, I became afraid. He said, I developed a way to celebrate life between steps because I knew that the next step could be the end for me. So he said, I developed a whole system of celebrating life between steps. I said, yes. He said, I left Vietnam. And ever since I have left Vietnam, with every step I take, I celebrate life. For me, it has been 30 years of my cover, which is working with international relations. And 30 years later, no matter what I read, no matter what I play, what I write, what I see, no matter the joy, no matter the suffering, no matter the place, no matter the time, no matter the marvelous revelations of the day, it is the same story, it is the same struggle. of keeping passageways open between the mind and the heart. Learning to be a beginner. Learning to be a beginner. For me, it is a joy to be with you. Trying to put myself in a state of being here this morning and experiencing the light that has been shed upon my path by the speakers before me, by the audience, by everyone here. What came to me, and going back and remembering yesterday, day before yesterday, day before, what came to me is to say to you that I stand here, I stand here partly showing off my privilege. And by that I mean the good fortune that has been given to me to go to schools and to travel. That indeed for me is a privilege. And for me, standing before you is one way of showing off my privilege. As I was telling a friend of mine, whom I was asking money from, 
for peace studies at my university. She said, what are you doing? I said, I'm showing off to you my privilege. I have a responsibility. Each one of us shows our privilege in our own way, in different ways. No one person's show off our privilege is any better or worse than any other person. And I say showing off my privilege, showing off my privilege because I carry within me a scene that keeps with me, it doesn't leave me. The scene, the sight of, a, of, of mothers queuing in line. This was in the Middle East. This was about a year ago. And there were literally hundreds of mothers, women, some of them carrying children. And when I came to inquire of one what they were waiting in line for, the lady looked at me. She said, to get powdered milk. And she pointed to the baby she was carrying. She said, for my baby. And no sooner had she finished telling me that, when I saw the most sophisticated arms going to the front, because that country at that time was at war. That country is not at war today. But I remember the sight of the mother, of mothers, waiting in line to find milk for their infants, while more than 50% of the revenue of their nation is going to arms. and then going to another place and the another place seeing children playing soccer. And they are playing soccer with half a soccer ball eaten up and most of them not having shoes. So I said to myself, my returning to the United States, I want to get as many soccer balls with me as I can and take them back to the Middle East. You have to take more soccer balls. The task given to me has been to talk about cooperative politics, politics of cooperation. The notion of politics of cooperation for me is inseparable from what we have been talking about. Going back over what we have been hearing and what we have been experiencing, the collapse of distance, the emergence of the first global political civilization, the emergence of the first global cultural civilization, the emergence of the first global economic civilization. Witnessing the emerge for the first time in history, we have seen ourselves moving from a context of humankind that experiences its collective life as fragments of a whole to a new context. A humankind experiencing itself as whole. Within the context of a humankind experiencing itself as whole, it is not possible, it's not possible anymore to say or to practice the proposition that there are public goods and private goods and that different units in the system, different nation states. If each one of the nation states pursued its own self-interest, somehow we will all be better off. Increasingly, it's becoming clear that this is not working if it has ever worked. The challenge we are facing is a challenge of how do we deal with public goods? Oceans, air, 
pollution, ecology, resources, they are all public goods. The competitive system that we have developed over millennia, the competitive system, by the way, is not a creation of the West. The West, at this juncture in history, has given it its most articulate expression. Going back to Hobbes, Locke, Rousseau, Adam Smith, Marx, but as a way of doing business, it is what has been for millennia. It is unfair then to merely to say it's Western. What the West has done to it, it has given it its Western characteristics, no question about that. What I'm referring to when I speak about cooperative politics, it refers to voluntary association. It refers to the proposition that public goods cannot be dealt with through competitive mechanisms, through the proposition that if every state pursues itself, its self-interest will be better off, that we all have to participate. We all have to do that. Hence, when we speak of cooperative politics, we are talking about, one, the development of common objectives. Because oftentimes in my university, when I'm talking about cooperative politics, that comes at the end of the semester when we say, and now let's move to cooperative politics. And they say, okay, I go to the classroom. They say, what do we do now? Well, I said, they say, what's step number one? And I try it, and I try it. It doesn't work. Step number one is a hard step. Step number one requires our own, our own recognition that we have to identify common objectives, objectives that we can share in, common objectives that can benefit those who are supposed to participate in them. That's very important when we talk about cooperative politics, common objectives. Another important factor about cooperative politics, if we are to cooperate, there has to be a distribution of cost and benefits. There has to be a balancing of cost and benefits. In the absence of that balancing or distribution of cost and benefits, there cannot be cooperation. There will continue to be domination, competition. The sharing of cost and benefit is what brings persons to cooperate. If you are asking me to cooperate with you, and I merely am going to share to bear the cost and not derive benefit, I'm not going to cooperate. So the distribution of cost benefit is important for cooperation. A third factor that has been also referred to in the gathering here has to do with leadership. Has to do with leadership. leadership. Because leadership develops the mechanisms necessary for cooperation. Leadership develops the sense of solidarity. Leadership practices the sacrifices that are needed. For example, we in the United States, when we call upon the rest of the world to cooperate, and when we ask other nations to limit population growth, our plea has no credibility. Because while it is true, population is a factor in the depletion of resources, consumerism is also a factor in the depletion of resources. For every um, a child born in the United States is more like 100 born or 200 or 300 born in India. 
I'm, I'm not giving you the equal distribution of depletion of resources. So when we are talking about cooperative politics, that's what, those are some of the ideas that come to mind. The question becomes, what are some of the underlying premises of cooperative politics? Maybe a story can say it better. Because don't forget, any time we use words, words reduce the essence. And hence, the concern of everyone here with the volume of words is understandable. Because words reduce essence. It's a story about, about the, it has to do with divine will and human responsibility. It's a story about a Westerner who went east and after ordering a shirt to be tailored and agreeing upon price and style, inquired from the shirt maker when the shirt will be ready and the man said come in two weeks and our friend returned in two weeks and the shirt wasn't completed. The man asked when will my shirt be ready? The man said inshallah, that means God willing come in one week. Our friend came back in one week. He said, please, this time, tell me when my shirt will be ready, but take God out of it. <laughs> Don't tell me, inshallah. The man said, if I take God out of it, I can't tell you when your shirt will be ready. <laughs> so that's the East. The East is a place where, where human responsibility has gone to lunch. <laughs> human responsibility has gone to lunch, but the divine is forever present. <laughs> the divine has been walking the streets of the East for thousands of years. In fact, the divine has become so tired walking the, walking the east, it has become barefoot. It has become barefoot. It is aching. It is in pain. So I will send the shirt maker came west to find out how westerners are doing. And our friend came west, and when he came west, he went to San Francisco and looked at in San Francisco, and he saw Americans, many Americans with, with long pieces of wood in their hands. They were trying to, they are working in the Pacific Ocean. He said, what are you doing? They said, we are making yogurt. He said, making yogurt? They said, yes. He said, making yogurt out of this water? They said, yes. He said, do you have yogurt culture? They said, no. He said, how can you make yogurt without yogurt culture? Ah, they said, if you try hard enough, you can make anything out of anything. <laughs> this is the West. <laughs> what has happened in the West, what has happened in the West, the divine will went out to lunch. <laughs> After creating the universe, the divine, it was decided in the West, Thank you, divine will, go to lunch. <laughs> we don't need you anymore. <laughs> Yet in the West, human responsibility has been walking the cities of the West for a very long time. Human responsibility in the West has become barefoot. Human responsibility in the West is pained. That's why we are here. We are bringing East and West together. Because in those societies where, there, where divine will has gone to lunch, the energies of that society become misdirected. And in a society where human responsibility has gone to lunch, the energies of that society become dissipated. So when we talk about cooperative politics, we are talking about certain basic things. We are talking about bringing together 
divine will and human responsibility. We are talking about understanding the self. And one step we take in the exercise of our choice is personal disarmament. Personal disarmament. Personal disarmament. Personal disarmament. <laughs> Yes, personal. For each and every one of us to, to just look within, to look within, to look within. And while you are looking within, to have compassion for without. Personal disarmament. Just to become personally disarmed. Personal disarmament so that we can check into our system of self-governance. How are we governing ourselves? Because after all, for me, spiritual growth is a question of self-governance. It's a question, question of freedom. Question of to be free Freedom to be, freedom to be. It is a question of recognizing that in dealing with myself and with my universe, there is a task and there is an experience. My task gives me the cover of being a professor of confronting the things that need to be confronted. My experience is my own personal growth. My experience leads me to ask myself to go back to the beginning and relearn relearn the alphabet of existence and return every morning to repeat the exercise i am the mother of my senses i feed them from the inside and my senses are my mother. They feed me from the outside. There is eternity only in motherhood. Through my senses, I become the spirit of eternity. Through me, my senses become the essence of existence. We are one with the one. So for me then, as I stand before you, I am experiencing the consciousness of oneness. The consciousness of oneness. The consciousness of solidarity. Solidarity from global perspectives. It is said that after creating the universe, the creator took a rest. And while resting, the creator had a dream. And in the dream, the creator discovered that while the creator has created the universe, only the creator knew the secrets of the universe. So the creator said, that cannot be. Suppose I die and something happens to me, and I'm gone. <laughs> what will become of the universe? 
the Creator awakened in the midst of the dream and created woman and man so that they become a surprise for the universe. And the universe becomes a blessing unto them. But again, the Creator was not fully satisfied. So the Creator took the key that held the secrets of the universe and said, key, disappear forever. And the Creator threw away the key that held the secrets of the universe. And the Creator said, let every woman and every man, with every breath they take, recreate the universe. Standing before you I am experiencing a reinvestment of the sacred. For me the sacred is any process that links me to the largest context to which I belong. When I feel I am Jew I am Muslim, I am Buddhist, I am Hindu, I am woman, I am man. I am gay, I am not gay. I'm, I am black, I am white. When I experience the largest context to which I belong, I experience the sacred. When first, second and third world become world, when the oppressor and the oppressed change into people, experiencing the vicissitudes of life, when propositional knowledge and anecdotal knowledge are the roots of knowledge, when reason and intuition complement one another and their complementary function is creativity. For me that is a sacred and for me this has been a sacred time. Some of us shed tears. Some of us laughed. Some of us danced. But all of us experienced a consciousness of oneness. There are more stories and more stories, but we need time for ourselves, away from stories. Let me conclude with a poem. It has no title, but if one wishes to give it a title, one may call it Homeland. It is a poem by a grandmother to her offspring, where she tells him, if my love takes you away from this world and makes you forget the past, and your heart sees only the moment, then come to me. Innocence is our nationality. Simplicity is our identity. It is given only to those who stay to build their new homeland. Yes. Probably from my experience, about 32 people inhabit this planet. We go by different names and different nationalities. Yes, indeed, one of the first open secrets that one learns in the oneness of consciousness, in the consciousness of 
of solidarity. Secret number one, the divine is real. And what that means for me, it means everything and everyone are connected. Secret number two, Satan is also real. That means we can also be disconnected if, if we so desire. And secret number three, enlightenment can come to anyone, anytime, any place. Whether we eat vegetarian food or <laughs> we don't eat it. And a fourth secret is what we have been witnessing here with the other secrets. That our planet, our planet is a lover, is a lover, it's a lover. And in thinking about our planets, what comes to mind is an old Sufi, an old Sufi diagram. Maybe you can put the diagram, the two, the two, <coughs> just explain them to you for a moment, then we'll stop. Now, the, the, the term love triangle was, not, uh, was given to this by if someone, many of you may know, his name is Wally Amos, the cookie man, famous Amos. I, I discovered he gave it this name because a book of his that came out recently entitled The Power Within. He was, he was generous to mention me in his book. And he writes in his book, he said he, he wanted always to have a model that would remind him about love and life because, and himself, because that for him was a triangle. He calls it a triangle. And then he refers to an experience I had with him when he asked me once about love, life, and me. And I shared with him the Sufi perspective, that from the perspective of Sufis, there is an outer triangle and an inner triangle. The outer triangle is thought on top of the triangle. At the base left of the triangle is deed, at the base right of the triangle is word. This is the outer triangle, thought, deed, word. However, there is the inner triangle. And the inner triangle is love, lover and beloved, meaning that our thought must be must always be a reflection of love. That in every thought we maintain, it must be a reflection of love. That in every deed we perform, we must perform, as, perform that deed as the lover. That in every act we perform, we act like a lover acts. We buy flowers, we court, we love, we hug, we embrace, we are one. And that in every word we utter, we must remember that we are speaking to the beloved. So we become artists, we, come, we become poets. So we become one with the one. The spiritual world and the material world become one. We experience, we experience the humanization of the divine and the consecration of the human. We experience the humanization of the divine in that idols and beliefs become removed. Nothing separates us. And we experience the consecration of the human because we discover that the divine has a claim in everything we do. That indeed each and every one of us is chosen, is a chosen person, is a chosen person. Every one of us can reflect 
upon the universe. Every one of us has a choice. Every one of us has a choice. We have few minutes that I would like to use in the following sense. We began at, my time began about 20 before 12. I was promised one hour and 25 minutes, but never mind that. <laughs> There's an exercise that we perform. Anyone who wishes to participate is welcome to do so. Everyone is free to participate or not to participate. There is a Sufi term, there is a Sufi term called Talab. Talab means order, O-R-D-E-R. -E when we go to a restaurant, we place our order with whoever is serving the food. Order, however, has an inner meaning. As we experience the reinvestment of the sacred, we take steps, and every time we take a step, and this was mentioned earlier, we encounter obstacles, challenges, difficulties. So the process of Talab, as we do it, is for the person who wishes to participate to put on a piece of paper, it's a small card, the challenge, the obstacle, that's standing in the way. For some of us, it may be fear. For some of us, it may be lack of faith. It could be many things. If anyone wishes to participate, what we do then, we say, for me it is this. Then, in the next 10 minutes, Lee what Lee will do, she will collect whoever has a card, and after collecting the cards, Lee will go out and will sort them out. Some of them will be duplications. Then Lee will come back and she will read the cards. There are no names. There are no names on the cards. Lee will read the cards, she will say faith. And then person or persons here who either have issues with faith as an obstacle, or who have dealt with it. That for them at this time, it is something that they have overcome, that they have dealt with the issue of faith, that that's not an issue for them anymore. So for the two groups to get together, the one, two, or three persons for whom faith is an issue, and the one, two, or three persons for, him, for whom faith is something that they have overcome. Essentially, the way we do this is simple. We become teachers and learners for one another. Because every one of us brings with us a unique consciousness. Every one of us is a teacher and a learner for every one of us. Yes. When I speak about East and West, each one of us has within us East and West. Because when we deal with Gaia, we are, we are experiencing the fusion of East and West. We are experiencing the fusion of, of reason and paradox. So for anyone who wishes to do that, please go ahead and, and take the cards and give them. And or give them. Then what we will do, we'll be collecting them. And I'm taking about 10 minutes 10 minutes, no more than that, to give you the results. And the results are as follows. When we come back, meaning with the cards, and those who raise their hands, either they have this issue of faith or they have dealt with it, if they so desire, they are free to do or not to do, then they will get together. They will raise their hand, for example, when we read the card, faith, some raise their hand, then they will go and decide to do with one another what they decide to do. They may decide to exchange addresses, they may decide to talk now, 
They may decide to talk later, they may decide to have lunch, they may decide to do nothing. Or they may alert one another as to how they have done it. How I have dealt with the issue of faith. How each one of us has done with that issue or fear or whatever the issue is. So you collect the cards and we will continue for about 10 minutes, but I can't resist one last story. <laughs> Ten. For, because very close to my heart. It has to do with watermelons. <laughs> Good. <laughs> it has to do with watermelons. Someone asked me a question when I first came to the United States, as usually people ask when someone visits a country. I was a little, I was a little, Littler than now, I'm still little. I was about 17, it was in New York City. It was July, it was hot. My first, my first ever visiting to the United States. I saw the Empire State and billions of automobiles. It was majestic, it was really impressive, but Impressive as everything appeared to me, it was like seeing the movie after reading the book. I expected that. <laughs> but then the second day downtown Manhattan, I saw something totally unexpected. It was hot. I looked and it was a small grocery store. And in that small grocery store, the, the proprietor was standing outside and he had watermelon sliced in half. I had never seen a watermelon sliced in half in my life before. I had been to France, to Italy, to Britain, to Holland. It had never occurred, go back 35 years, to any of those people to slice a watermelon and sell it. I said, my God. I looked, I said, now I understand the genius of Americans. <laughs> I had never seen in a gro grocery store a watermelon sliced in half. And as I was pondering the genius of Americans, the gentleman looks at me and said, Sonny, he said, if that's too big for you, we'll sell to you by weight. <laughs> sell to you by weight. So the story of the watermelon is about the two kingdoms. The kingdom of the wise and the kingdom of the fools which is in each and every one of us. The kingdom of the wise decided to send a delegate to the kingdom of the fools to find out how the fools are doing. <laughs> <laughs> and the delegate arrived at the kingdom of the fools and saw the whole population of the kingdom surrounding a watermelon with bows and arrows and shields and stones, and the delegate of the kingdom of the wise looks at them and said, no wonder they call you fools. He said, what are you doing? This is a watermelon. It is delicious. You open it, you eat it, you quench your thirst with it. The delegate did not even, was not even permitted to finish his proclamation. He was immediately executed. That's the kingdom of the fools within us. 1,000 years later, the kingdom of the wise decided to send another delegate to find out what has happened to the former delegate who was sent to the kingdom of the fools. But this time, this time they sent a woman. They sent a woman. And the woman delegate arrives to the kingdom of the fools and the sight, the scene was the same. Nothing had changed except it was about five billion people. They didn't have bows and arrows, they had Kalishnikovs guided and misguided missiles. <laughs> and our delegate looked at all of them. John Evans was the delegate this time. She looked at all of them. And she 
She looked at everyone. She said, yes. Our challenge is how can we transform this into something we can all share? Something that will give life to all of us. Something that will benefit all of us. That's our challenge. Our challenge. It is hard for me when I pray at night before sleeping. Because I, I thank the Creator. Because what the Creator has given me is more than my ability to hold in my hands. So when I, before sleeping, I always pray. I say, please, Creator, give me the imagination of all the poets. And give me the compassion of all the mothers. And give me the strength of all the giants. And give me the patience of all the jobs. So that I am able to hold the trust that you have entrusted me. It's a tough one. It's a hard one. طال الفراق يا حبيبي طال الفراق بين الرفاق طال الفراق طال الفراق Oh beloved, separation has been long between us. Let us get together again. طال الفراق بين الأحباء يا حبيبي طال الفراق طال الفراق Separation has been long. Separation has been long. Because the cooperative view is a view of oneness. It's a recognition that the spiritual and the material are two dimensions of the same. Are two dimensions of the same. I won't say to you that while I am here, my soul has been feasting feasting. It has been a feast for my soul. But it has also been a feast for my mind, which is good for me. Because like you, every one of us, go through periods where we, when we experience, someone asked me yesterday, how does it feel? It was Tony. Tony Judge asked me, how does it feel? I told him when I'm in the West, my soul fasts and my mind feasts and when I go to the east my mind fasts and my soul feasts <laughs> but east and west is in each and every one of us it is in each and every one of us when we begin to discover that our being is a celebration of the union between the mind and the heart it is, a it is a preparation and celebration of the union. That our being is to become conductors of energy. We are conductors of energy. But the threat, what reduces, what blocks the conductors of energy, two things block us as conductors of energy, self-sufficiency and self-importance. Self-sufficiency and self-importance. So let the currents move, let the currents move, and let us be who we are, energy and conductors of energy.